Well, welcome to this talk on the subject of osmosis and diffusion. Now, there's several scientific processes that it's important to understand in healthcare, and this is one of them, osmosis and diffusion. There's a great deal of clinical application of these principles. So let's try and get an understanding of what they are, and we'll start off with diffusion. We'll look at diffusion first, then we'll look at osmosis. And the first thing I want to do is put some red ink into a jam jar over here. And what we have here is a jam jar of tap water. And I'm just going to put in some ordinary red ink. Just a few drips into there. The drop should do. Okay. Now I'm not going to touch this or stir it up. And at the moment, I think you can see there's some areas where there's only water and some areas where there's ink. Let's come back in a few minutes and uh, look at that again. Now let's think about what's happening in that jam jar in terms of molecules. So this is the jam jar here. And that jam jar is full of water. In other words, it's full of water molecules. That's what, that's what a jam jar full of water is. It's a, it's a jam jar full of water molecules, in fact. All close together, much closer than this. Many more than this, of course, many millions of them. Many, many millions, in fact. OK, so it's a jam jar full of water molecules. But these water molecules are not standing still. They're actually in motion. They're actually vibrating very quickly. So only one water molecule is vibrating back and forward in a random way. They are in random motion. They are vibrating. There is molecular vibration in that jar. Now why is there molecular vibration? Why, why is each water molecule randomly vibrating? Well the answer to this question is that that jar of water there possesses heat. By virtue of the fact it's in this room at the moment it possesses heat. And actually I cheated a bit, I put hot water in it as well. So it possesses heat. But it would still work with cold water, it would just work slower. Cold water actually possesses heat. In fact everything possesses heat that is greater than a particular temperature referred to as absolute zero. An absolute zero is minus 273 degrees centigrade. So if you cool things down to zero degrees centigrade, you can carry on cooling them down and down and down and down and down. And in theory, you could keep on cooling it down to minus 273 degrees centigrade. In practice, you couldn't quite do it, but people have got fairly close to it. But once you get to minus 273 degrees centigrade, the molecules have stopped vibrating and are standing still. So imagine this, this jar of water is probably at, say, 45 degrees, and the molecules are vibrating quite quick. But if you slow it down to, say, 10 degrees, they'll be vibrating slower. Minus 10 degrees, well, there would be an ice, but if there was molecular vibration in a fluid, then it would be slower still. Several hundred degrees centigrade, but so, sorry, several hundred degrees to, say, 200 degrees below freezing, the vibration would be very slow, and eventually the vibration would stop. When it's stopped, it can't get any cooler. That's known as absolute zero. So anything w that it possesses heat, so that certainly applies to all physiological temperatures, the molecules in the fluid are vibrating. And remember, a fluid, in terms of physics, may either be a liquid or a gas. Both are fluid. Solids are not, but liquids or gases are. And diffusion will occur in any fluid 
in theory, which is greater than minus 273 degrees centigrade. Of course, minus 273 degrees centigrade is 0 degrees Kelvin. So 273 degrees Kelvin is 0 degrees centigrade. So they possess movement by virtue of the fact they possess heat. Heat energy, then, is molecular vibration. This is known as the kinetic theory or the kinetic principle of temperature. Kinetic means movement. Kinos means movement. So the temperature exists because of the kinetic energy possessed by the individual water molecules. They are in motion. And later on we're going to come and look at Brownian motion, which in a sense is what we're coming on to now. So let's go back up to the jar here. And what we did was reintroduce some red ink. And to begin with, the drop of red ink was mostly all in one place. Now the red ink, of course, is also molecular in nature. It also possesses temperature, therefore it's also randomly vibrating as well. The red ink is randomly vibrating. So these are randomly vibrating also. That way and this way, all over the place, randomly vibrating. So, if this is randomly vibrating and this is randomly vibrating, they're going to randomly vibrate into each other. There's going to be many, many millions of random collisions. And if these substances are of the same mass, and they don't settle out, as, as in this case with the ink and the water, then they carry on vibrating and bumping into each other. And what this means is that after a period of time, it ends up being random where any one ink molecule is. So because they're all bumping into each other, they get mixed up. So what you end up with is ink molecules all over the place. And because there's many millions of these ink molecules, and because the collisions are random, the principle of probability dictates that they're going to end up evenly distributed throughout the medium. And that is all diffusion is. It's the tendency for concentrations to become equal in a fluid. It occurs because of the kinetic energy possessed by the molecules of both fluids as a result of their heat. So let's define diffusion now. Here's a definition of it. The process whereby fluids, that is gases and liquids, of different concentrations, and remember when we first introduced the ink, there were some areas with ink, of high concentrations. There's other areas where the water was still clear. So the concentrations were different. It's whereby they intermingle. They all mix up together until the distribution is homogeneous when they're brought into contact. So diffusion, the process whereby gases and liquids of different concentrations intermingle when brought into contact until their concentrations are equal throughout. So this applies to gases and liquids. So let's just look at one example of this in physiology. Let's imagine this is a blood capillary here. And let's imagine this is the alveoli of the lung. So this is air here, and of course it's blood uh, in the red cells. I'll just draw some red cells there in the capillary. 